Welcome everyone. I can see that there are people that the attendees are starting to slowly make their way into the webinar. Um, last week, I, I presented to you, uh, or at least I hosted the session while we uh, focused on net zero and real zero and what kind of false solutions we see around those issues. Today, we're here for the second part of the Climate Justice Summer School webinar series. Jesus, that's a mouthful. Um, and uh, today we're, to, we're here to discuss the term just transition and specifically what it means in terms of agriculture and extractives work. Um, today, I get to have the chance to not host the session. I get to hand this over to my colleague, Sophie. Um, and uh, I hope you all uh, very much enjoy this. Again, if you have any questions, make sure to put it in, your, in the question and answer section. And uh, be sure to be ready to answer some questions of our, from our side throughout the session, because you're going to have some pop-ups where we expect you to, uh, to do some small multiple choice things to make sure that you're still awake and with us. Um, but I'm sure this is all going to go swimmingly. Perfect. Sophie, over to you. Thank you very much, Niels. I would just like to check whether everybody can hear me correctly. Um, please give a sign if not. Um, thank you for having me, Niels. Um, I will start with a short introduction of myself before I share my screen. Um, so my name is Sophie Quizera. I am uh, the co-head of the department uh, policy and programs where uh, we do quite some work on extractives, land rights, uh, uh, food, uh, climate justice, of course, even though those uh, uh, thematic areas are also intertwined. But we also do a lot of work on tax justice and corporate accountability, to name a few, all under the umbrella of uh, women's rights and a feminist angle uh, of tackling all these major problems that we try to um, uh, work on as Action Aid the Netherlands. Um, today, I invited a few of my colleagues from the Federation to also help me um, explain to you guys or take you along our work under the term just transition. And I hope you will enjoy and uh, also get a more clearer understanding of what we do as Action Aid the Netherlands, but also with our partner organizations. I will share my screen now. Yes. So today we're going to discuss a little bit uh, about just transition. What does just transition mean uh, for action aid, uh, but also how does that manifest in our work and how do we see that coming forward? So we, we named this session Shaping Energy and Food Systems that Work for Women and Communities, basically because we see that uh, food systems uh, and energy systems currently, so whether it's extraction or agriculture, uh, are uh, mainly not uh, working at the advantage of women of or communities and throughout these sessions I hope you'll get more of an understanding of why we find this to be important and why we do the work we do uh, to realize this. Um, so today I will start a little bit with the introduction on our uh, principles. So um, as Action Aid uh, with the Federation with my colleague uh, Teresa Anderson, I think you uh, spoke to her last week, um, she and I, uh, with a lot of input from uh, our other colleagues uh, worldwide, we develop key principles for a just transition on which we base all our work basically. And um, this was also to explain why is it, it, it is important for us as Action Aid to also engage in realizing a just transition, but also why it is so important for us to have some sort of key principles that we can hold on to throughout all our work. So I will do that. After that, I will introduce my colleague Esther uh, Kisembo from Uganda. She will uh, tell a little bit uh, about land grabbing in, in Uganda, which is also uh, one major issue to be addressed uh, under the just transition. Uh, unfortunately, today our colleague uh, Darlington was not able to join, uh, who's from Zimbabwe, but I will take over and tell you a little bit about a specific Sengwa project on which uh, we did quite some advocacy work um, uh, that uh, resulted in uh, some, some successful actions. So that is uh, 
uh, something I'll talk about a little bit later. And then uh, last but definitely not least, our colleague uh, Jaisa San Sanchez will tell you a little bit on all ad advocacy work, research um, and, and groundwork we have been doing on palm oil in Guatemala. Um, and as Niels indicated, we'll have uh, the opportunity for you to pose questions throughout the session. But what we're going to do is uh, keep the last 15 minutes at the end for uh, you to discuss uh, the questions with us. So put them in the chat, please. And at the end, we'll give uh, all the speakers the opportunity to answer your questions. And uh, I trust that Niels and Soraya will guide us through these questions that will be coming in throughout the session. So I would like to start with a, a very nice question for everybody. Um, uh, if correct, it showed up in your screen by now, which basically asks you where, whether you are familiar with where, with where the term just transition comes from. Do you think this term comes from trade unions? Do you think this term comes from civil society organizations or is it from grassrooted movements uh, uh, that have come up with this uh, just transition term before I start explaining our principles and why this term is so important. Go ahead and cast your vote. We have 20 out of 23 participants, 21 out of 23, yeah. we're almost there. 22, now we're just waiting for that last one and otherwise we're going to close it in 10 seconds time. Perfect. And as hopefully you can see now, um, most of you have said that uh, we have about a 50-50 split between civil society and grassroots with yeah. a small minority of you saying trade unions. Sophie, what do yeah. we think about this? Yes, this is uh, indeed what I thought the answer would be, but uh, this term uh, uh, officially originates from uh, the trade unions. Uh, this basically um, from trade unions within the global north, so European trade unions, which uh, wanted to make sure that uh, coal mining communities, so as you know, for example, the Netherlands is a very good example of this, uh, when the coal mining in the southern part of this country uh, stopped, uh, people that were in the mining uh, areas had to find new jobs, had, had to find new ways to provide in their livelihoods. Uh, and that's when uh, trade mo movements uh, in, in, in the North, in the Netherlands came together and uh, advocated towards the Dutch government to recreate opportunities and to make sure that the transition from uh, coal mining, so all, all this mainly men that had been working generations within the, mine, oh, the coal mining um, uh, sector, that they would be able to transition to more, um, uh, to other jobs, are the kind of jobs which would also be able to, in which way they would also be able to provide in their livelihoods and take care of their families. Um, a very good example of how uh, this manifested is, for example, that two years ago when we went on a speaker tour to Limburg uh, to visit old miner, miners, coal miners, they explained to us how the grassrooted movement or no, the trade union movement uh, worked together with the national government to create new job opportunities. And there was this man that indicated that he went from a, a very tough uh, and muscular coal miner to working in uh, women lingerie shops and developing lingerie for women. So that is uh, part, part of uh, that just transition back then was really about how do we make sure that the um, coal miners transition into different kinds of jobs and also get the skills to do so. And throughout the time, that's when the just transition also in the bigger scheme of um, making sure that we address climate change right now, uh, this term was broadened to more than just trade unions or coal miner, miners uh, to, in our case, uh, women and communities as a whole to uh, profit from transitioning from our old system uh, of working our food systems and energy systems that have not been beneficial for uh, the communities and women in particular to make sure that when we transition to more sustainable ways of uh, energy provision, but also more sustainable ways of uh, pro uh, pro uh, 
uh, producing foods that women and communities are not forget forgotten in that. So that's how we also built up on that initial a uh, very good term that started from trade unions, but needed to be broadened to uh, not just people in the formal working sector, but also communities and particularly women whom are not uh, always part of uh, uh, the quote unquote job market, uh, as was the case for the uh, mining uh, workers that had to transition. So uh, if we look at the key principles that we have identified as Action Aid, um, we can um, identify four pillars, um, which uh, are quite um, specific in saying what we actually want in, in this just transition. And what we want is not the only thing we want, but it's also how do we get there? So just transition is not necessarily just an end goal, but it's also how do we ensure that in transitioning, um, you do it the right way. Um, so the first pillar that we identified was to make sure that we address inequalities and do not exacerbate them. So when you look at food systems, for example, what you don't want is uh, for the big uh, firms or um, uh, the big companies to dictate where we're going when it comes to renewable energy or uh, new, uh, more sustainable uh, food systems. What you want is um, that all of society or people that play a part in um, uh, finding solutions for a, a better climate um, for everyone are included and in, in terms of, uh, for example, um, extraction that we don't see again or exacerbate the fact that when, uh, for example, minerals are extracted, they come to certain people and they profit from them. And then uh, local communities are left behind with uh, nothing or very minimal, or you see that their local environment is uh, only degraded because of these extra actions. Um, so besides uh, addressing inequalities and not um, uh, exacerbating them, we also think um, that the systems as we have them now, where the power lays in, in mainly the global north, in those that have the most money, uh, is not suited, is not designed to work for people, not for nature, nor for the climate. And if we just do it as we have al already known and just put a green or sustainable uh, label on it, it will not work. It will not be just because yet again, we'll be exacerbating inequalities, we'll be leaving people behind. And in certain senses, I think we'll, we might even be um, uh, damaging our climate even more instead of actually doing something to address it. As I indicated, the just transition is not only uh, the end goal, but it's also how do we do it? And how do we do that? That is by ensuring inclusiveness and, part and participation from all different angles. So there were, uh, in this case, you might have formalized trade unions be part of uh, different calls and different discussions on how to design uh, the new energy policies. You would also want to involve, uh, particularly from the global south, communities that are in uh, mining areas or community that are being lobbed, robbed from their lands um, to produce mass uh, uh, palm pl plantations or, or or soy plantations. What you what you want or what we actually ask for within a just transition is to make sure that. Uh, in that spectrum of stakeholders that are going to design or that are designing because we're already trying to get into that transition, particularly to address the climate change issues. What you want to do is that uh, all of the people that could possibly um, feel some sort of effect of this transition uh, must and should in some way be included and participate in uh, the discussion on how to develop these plans. And of course, when they are included, that's how you can develop comprehensive plans and policy frameworks, uh, which translate in actions that will also benefit them uh, concretely. I think I will stop there with the vague, big terms, and I would like to uh, give the floor particularly to my colleague Esther now to maybe dive in a little bit um, uh, showcasing what is happening in Uganda and where we see the transformation needed in how now we have been working or uh, they have been working in Uganda and how that has not been benefiting the local communities. Uh, Esther, please, if you're available. Um, 
it is uh, your turn and uh, I'll be uh, guiding the slides if you give me a sign to go to the next one. Thank you very much, Sophia. Hello, everyone. I'm called Esther Kisimbo, as already said. Uh, I work with NAID Uganda, maybe for status. Uganda is in the east uh, of Africa. Uh, so uh, as Action Aid Uganda, we, we work, uh, we get funds uh, from uh, actually Netherlands to where we implement uh, a project called Fair, Green uh, and Global, FGG. We're now implementing the um, project uh, three of the Fair, Green and Global. And among the key things that we work on under this project, um, we, we work on land investments. Uh, here we're looking at land grabs uh, specifically among other things. So um, Sophie, let's go to the, to the next slide. So um, if we talk about land grabs, um, it's not something really very new uh, to, to our country or to the world, it's been ongoing. And uh, you find that it's, it's a global kind of, of, uh, of, of problem that has that started some time back. And even up to today, people are still uh, experiencing threats or evictions uh, to, this, to, the, to the land grabs. And this, uh, of course, where there is land grabs, in most cases, we find there's an infringement on people's rights, uh, both uh, rights like right to food, uh, the inhumane and uh, inhumane treatment and degrading treatment to the community members. Uh, there's uh, a right to housing. Uh, we have uh, we have really very many uh, rights. Looking at the environmental, looking at the social, and looking at the economic rights. So um, in Uganda, we've, we also in, in the past years we've experienced this um, issue of land grabs, especially um, having. Um, countries especially investors from the north coming into the south where uh, where uganda is and uh, due to the different demand demands of food uh urbanization uh demands of uh, investments you find that um most of the investors are coming from the north coming to africa especially uganda in this context and then we are having um the investors having to do contracts and assign agreements with a with a government uh, officials, and in most cases, you find that these agreements that they sign, they are not uh, really, they're not uh, people friendly or community friendly. And when we talk about community friendly, we're talking about uh, the inequalities that are that are envisaged in these agreements. And looking at the women, especially looking at the girls and looking at the children, so you find that when this is happening, there are always those issues that are. Um, that's always coming, and that's why, uh, as Action Aid Uganda, we're always looking out and trying to help the women and the girls in this in this context. So, uh, sorry, I might not really read verbatim what we put there, but I'm just giving you a, a hint. So, um, before I go, I can go to the next uh, slide. There's a question there. I would uh, I would request that you can cast your vote, and then we see how to move on. Hope you can see it, but Mike can see it from my side. Increased international demand for animal and agricultural products and the uh, discovery of minerals and oil are the main drivers of land grabbing in Uganda. Is that true or false? Please uh, cast your vote. We're almost there again. We're waiting for the final vote to come in. I'll give you another five seconds. Mm. There we go. Great. Great. Uh, yes, it's so true because at least I had given it even in my, in my introduction. It's very true. Uh, so that's very good. Yeah. So um, next, the next slide, uh, Sophie. Yes, that's this one. Yes, it should be. Uh, so now this gives the context of, of what's happening in Uganda. And as I had already told you, you find that Uganda is no exception. Of course, the land evictions and problems because of what we've been experiencing. And the fact that in NGOs are trying to write reports on these cases, uh, we find that uh, we're still having these issues. And our, our government has allowed the foreign companies and the foreign investors to just come in 
and rob land at the detriment of the communities. And you find that uh, most of, uh, of the land that is being grabbed, it's either for food, that's why we have coffee plantations in Uganda right now with different investors, we're having um, palm oil, we're having sugarcane plantations, we're having flower, flower farms, and it is ETC, ETC. And then in the recent years, we've also uh, had a uh, discovery of oil in the west of Uganda. So you find that because of these issues, we are having very many investors coming in to, to, to you know, coming in and they need a lot of land. So at the end of the day, uh, you find that land grabbing is still an issue in Uganda. And when we talk about land in Uganda, land is something very uh, crucial and very valuable to the community because uh, most of the, of the economy of Uganda is based on land, it's based on agriculture. And over, Uganda has a percentage of uh, 45 million uh, Ugandans, but you find that over 80% of agriculture sector is being supported by women. It's women who are doing the most of the agriculture and they're doing it at both the large scale and also at the small scale. So it means that if there is any land grabs and there are any threats or evictions of the land and the women are not being put into consideration, because what happens in most cases, even where there are some remedies or like compensation, you find that it's the, the, the men who are getting the land, not the women. And if they leave the women on a very small, um, small scale of land, it means that it's going to affect the food production, it's going to affect their livelihood, it's going to affect the labor, and at the end of the day, the survival of the women and the vulnerable people. And at the end of the day, they're going to be landless. Next, next, Sophie. Uh, this is uh, part of the community, yeah, uh, that we work with in Uganda. Uh, I, 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 I thought this would be a very good photo for you to look at and you see what we are talking about how agriculture is so special, you know, to Uganda, how land is very special to Uganda. All these are gardens, I would say, and all these belong to women. They're the ones who cultivate this land. Men always come in to harvest and things like that. But all this is what we're talking about. And just maybe to note, this land was taken at one point by an investor, uh, but this one was a domestic investor in Uganda. And through our work, we had to work hard to have these people get back their land. And you can now see what's happening. People are now planting and uh, trying to improve on their livelihoods. So this was just a snapshot to show you what's happening and what we kind of do. Next, Sophie. Yes, here comes our second question on uh, what are the effects of land grabs on the local communities, especially women. So I would request that you can uh, kindly cast your votes. How are we doing, Sophie, on the vote on the voting? News. We're on 21 out of 25, so we'll give people another five seconds or so. Okay. Go. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. Cool. That's very good, very good, very good. It's a very interesting class. <laughs> yes, it is. So, indeed, all the above. And, uh, and as you see, um, they were categorized in terms of economic effects, environmental effects, and social effects. Um, you find that in terms of economics, we're looking at loss of livelihoods. Uh, we're looking at um, issues of uh, families not getting enough income. We're looking at people staying back in poverty. We're looking at food insecurity. So all these are effects, are economic effects due to the land grabs. And these are really happening in Uganda. And you find that uh, people are not having land, they're not owning land anymore. So it's, it's a sorry state, I would say. Um, when this happens in a community, it's something that is not very good and the economic and the economic effects because then the women are disempowered economically. And where the women are disempowered economically, especially the states of Uganda, you find that it's women who are holding up their families, their homes. So if they're not, they don't have the power, they don't have the money, they don't have all the things, then the family is going to 
to suffer at the end of the day. Then we also have environmental effects. Of course, when we talk about environmental effects, uh, since very many people come here to put put, put factories uh, for food, to, to do plantations and etc., we have experienced lots of deforestation. Um, most trees are being cut. We don't have any green. We don't have the, the we have a loss of biodiversity, loss of water gravity. We have all these issues. And at the end of the day, where the things are happening, there is going to be an effect on the climate change. If you just to note the principles that Sophie discussed, at the end of the day, we all come back to the same. We have our our environment being um being destroyed, we're having pollution, we're having um damage on our on our natural by by the city. we're having floods, we're having famine, we're having droughts because of what um what because of the effects that we're having on our environment. Of course, this is not something very good, and um, we are trying to, 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 of course, work with the government and to try to talk to the investors to tell them, look here, this, whatever is happening is affecting our, 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 our country. Then uh, we also have social effects. Of course, we talk about social effects, we're talking about um, loss of our heritage, we're, we're talking about, um, because at the end of the day, what happens, most people, when they're being evicted, uh, different communities end up going in different ways. Some of them are in camps, some of them uh, are not even in camps, they're somewhere, they don't even know where they are, or they're in a different region. So all this um, help, I mean, all this is is advantage to the customs, the traditions, the heritage. So you find that to um, a community that becomes landless, they don't have anywhere to, to, you know, to, to, to go back and say, this is where we're coming from. So it's a very big effect, uh, a social effect. Next, Sophie. Yeah, uh, before you can play this, <clears throat> uh, so uh, th this video is a short video um, that, try that is trying to show you the kind of work that we've done. Uh, we've been, we implemented what we call the FGG2 project, which ended last year in December. Uh, and this is a small video that we did on our land, on the land, on the land issues that we've worked on and the communities we've worked on. Kindly uh, play it, Sophie. Thank you. Volume, Sophie. There's no volume. Sophie, there's no volume. I think you need to unmute yourself, Sophie. Kindly unmute yourself, Sophie, and then you can play. Due to the continued land rights abuse and other injustices in the community, Action Aid International. Mm -hmm. Uh, funding from the National Ministry of Foreign Affairs started implementing fair, green, and global so foreign affairs in 2017. The overall objective of for some reason, Sophie, we only see a white screen right now. Um, um, let me see. Kindly, this is the technical things that always happen. Um. We can now see the screen, though it's paused, would be maybe. And now? I think now it's. Can, be it can you see it again? Yeah. Due to the continued land rights, abuse, and other injustices in the community, Action Aid International Uganda, with funding from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, started implementing Fair, Green, and Global Project 2 in 2016. The overall objective of FGG2 has been enhancing corporate accountability uh, in Uganda. We've been looking at land rights. 
specifically women land rights. We've partnered with the uh, Action Alliance. The discovery of oil in the Punyoro region had left many residents fighting for their basic rights. Albertine, for instance, with the discovery of oil, we have seen a number of uh, families being displaced. I'm among those. Who, I'm among those people need to have receive house. We are 73. Out of 73, they only built 46 houses. Out of 46 houses, 20, 27 did receive. Most members of the Bedet community currently derive their livelihoods from subsistence farming and grazing in this area. What I can I can single out as what has happened is that this government has accepted at last that Uncle Uwa encroached into the land which was for the Bedet community. Just like in Benet and many other areas in this distant Apa community in northern Uganda has not survived the ever-increasing land injustices in the country. The actual definition of the status of that area now is confused within the jurisdictions. Because of that confused jurisdiction, these other interests, the economic and political interests, have found space to immerse itself and create the sense of confusion that we see in a park. Unfortunately, it is the people who, who live there who have suffered all along. We are not yet free. Anything, a lot of violent words have been given us by the Wildlife Authority, the UPDF, or the security forces. With some of them, we have them in the recordings, and some of their activities have been taped. We have made some strides in supporting the, the people of APA. And so when we came in, we just supported the, the community of APA in first of all, um, letting them know their rights. Land issues is not a very easy issue. The last time we were in Hoiman, we, we saw how people were being compensated. You have 10 acres and I just give you one acre out of the 10 acres. So these are not really, really easy issues, but the communities have managed to stand out and not back out on their rights. At least now they know their land rights. And we believe that the next time such issues happen, they're going to be able to even teach other communities on how to be resilient and on how to stand against such violations and land crimes. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. So that short video uh, was just trying to show um, the funds that we get uh, from uh, from the foreign affairs uh, government. I mean, I mean, yeah, the Dutch government. What we are doing in terms of the land grabs. So we are supporting our various communities, uh, as you've seen in the video. And uh, it's all I should say um, with land issues in Uganda. It's not something where you just get results automatically. It's something whereby you have to, first of all, build the, the community's resilience, and then you, it, you have a, an advocacy or a campaign kind of thing, and you keep pushing the government, you keep pushing the investors until you are there. So far in the cases that we have, um, we've supported, there's a case that has taken 20 years, 20 years um, in, uh, in, in parliament, I mean, in the courts of law, and just uh, last year, that's when we got a judgment in favor of the people that were being evicted by a Germany investor who put coffee plantations. So um, it is something, actually that case happened when I was still in school. I've just come and here I am resolving the case after 20 years. So it is not something that is uh, easily you know, resolved, but it's something that you have to continue doing. So what are the recommendations at the end of the day? Of course, um, we, we have several recommendations, like having a resettlement plan. We're trying to say, look here, before you evict anyone, before you can take away someone's land, let's have a resettlement plan. Let's talk about their food production. Let's look at the welfare and the well-being and the livelihood of these communities. Don't just throw them away anyhow, because they are Ugandans and they need their land. So um, we have to look at that. Then we also need a, a kind of a platform for dialogue, whereby if, in case there's any issue, you can kindly come together and we get a dialogue and rules of the issue. Then we also need to have um, something to do with um, uh, what we call EPIC. This is a fair, fair prior informed consent of the communities. This is very key because then we shall then come to know 
what did the community cons consent to this? Do they have, did, was there any environmental assessment? Were they protected? Did the women, were the women being heard about all these issues? So I think when we have such, they need to be good to go. Yes, Sophie, the next one. Yes, um, maybe we also need to, uh, to look at securing land for demarcation from, um, in terms of the, of the diversity, inclusiveness, um, and then also looking at the income, looking at the climate change mitigation, all those issues is something that we think we can work with. And then also we need to have a, uh, to have a transparency in terms of valuation, in terms of compensating the people. Uh, you find that uh, someone has a lot of land, but they're compensating way less than what they're supposed to get. That is something that we need to talk about. And then also we need to look at environmental assessment, look at the climate uh, change issues, look at the uh, environmental in terms of pollution issues, looking at the, the, the effect on the water and ETC. So that is something that has not been done, but we recommend that it should, it should be done. Is there any other, Sophie? Yeah, so I think that is it. Um, Yes, uh, of course, uh, looking at uh, treaties, uh, working hand in hand with, uh, with the investors, both at the international level, and then also looking at resolution, not at only national, but even international level. And then knowing that there should be respect and protection of the indigenous people, their forests and their heritage. So my conclusion will just be uh, what Sophie just explained in her, in her, in, in her, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the beginning remarks, that's just my conclusion. I will not really have to repeat everything. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I am not sure if any questions have come in yet, but just to repeat, um, so we will have some 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for uh, the addressing of uh, all the questions that came up. Uh, thank you very much, es Esther. I think you were yet again very eloquent in explaining uh, how this work of land grabs really well fits in uh, the discussion of why we need to realize just transitions that not only work for uh, the big powerful, but also for the local communities and particularly women. Um, and uh, please stay in so we can answer some questions at the end. So as um, I indicated before, my colleague from Zimbabwe, unfortunately was struck by COVID um, and was not able to join us uh, today. Um, but because we have been working uh, side by side on this project and I am quite aware, I will try to um, explain a little bit what he wanted to share with you. Uh, and of course, all the questions, if I cannot answer them, I will definitely forward them to him uh, later on. Uh, and you can always get the answer afterwards. Um, so he wanted to speak to us about the Sengwa uh, coal pro uh, project, uh, which was uh, a major one in Zimbabwe. But before I go into that, I think we're going to start with a small question to see how good you are in uh, topography. Uh, where is Zimbabwe located? East Africa, West Africa, or Southern Africa, or Central Africa? for my notion to see where you guys are. And no quick Googling for those no. people who haven't answered yet. <laughs> no, definitely not. We're waiting on a couple more people. I'll give you another five seconds. There we go. Oh, uh, most of you had it correct, uh, but uh, I see also some other options. But uh, indeed, Zimbabwe is located in southern Africa, uh, near Z uh, South Africa. Um, so it's definitely in the southern part of Africa. Thank you very much, Niels. So in the context, um, uh, Zimbabwe has gone through a long period of political and uh, economic distress uh, under which uh, basically uh, the Second Republic said that they wanted to attract more foreign direct, uh, direct investments. So really money from outside to invest in the country uh, for more economic development. Um, 
and particularly for the um, elections that are expected in 2023, the government had immense pressure to see whether they could uh, make sure that this foreign direct investment was coming in to realize uh, projects within uh, the country itself. Um, so because it was mainly focused on attracting these foreign direct investments, uh, unfortunately, it was seen that uh, Zimbabwe were on, was only attracting deals that were not super favorable for Zimbabwe and the environment particularly. Uh, and Sen the Sengwa project is actually one good example of uh, uh, that. So uh, when you see, uh, when you look at the context in which the Sengwa project falls, uh, Zimbabwe had a very huge investment. They needed a huge investment for the energy sector because of the insufficient uh, uh, power levels that they had for industry and homes. So uh, for your indication, uh, Zimbabwe has a national power demand ranging between uh, 2,200 and 2,400 megawatts, but it only produces on only about half of that, which means that quite a lot of people still are there without energy. Um, so this is also part of the pressure for um, the government to try and attract um, investments to uh, make sure that they could produce more energy. Um, so this is how also the uh, in 2019, the uh, power station, which should produce more as well, more energy to uh, add to the national production right now, uh, the hydropower uh, was seen as not effective because uh, the water levels were super low because of the droughts that are being experienced in this uh, climate change era, meaning that they had to search for uh, new ways to generate energy. Um, and this is basically how the Sengwa project came into uh, effect. So the Sengwa uh, thermal project uh, was planned since a very long time ago. What does this project mean? This project was supposed to generate um, uh, about 280 megawatts of uh, coal power. Uh, but built in phases of 700 at the time. Um, but because of lack of investment, that project uh, never really started like that, um, which also led to that uh, insufficient produ production of national energy. Uh, but in 2018, this uh, commercial bank from China um, had made this promise to Zimbabwe or made this deal with the Zimbabwe government to um, fund this mega project in uh, uh, Zimbabwe. And uh, they promised around 3 billion um, to be able to produce this Sengwa project. And this is also where we started um, our campaigning efforts together with other local CSOs in Zimbabwe to make sure that this would not uh, continue and actually be realized because uh, what we, what was definitely wanted in Zimbabwe was yes, access to energy and more energy produced, but um, because of the uh, impact that coal uh, production has, um, it was not preferred that China, which would ha have uh, unfavorable uh, terms under which they landed Zimbabwe the uh, money to produce it was definitely not the choice of the local communities and that's how Action Aid Zimbabwe uh, constructed together with uh, uh, Zela, a local a low uh, civil society organization and other uh, CSOs locally, a campaign throughout last year also uh, funded under FGG2, Fair, Green and Global that we, are, we were implementing. Um, to really put pressure on the government uh, to uh, get away from this deal and try to invest more in sustainable energy instead of uh, such unfavorable deals like the one with China. Um, I think this uh, might have been one of the quickest results we have seen um, uh, based on advocating for quite a short time. As you heard uh, Esther say, sometimes uh, some advocacy or uh, actions from civil society can maybe take 20 years before any changes are made. But the Sengwa project, I think it was a couple of months ago, 
when we saw this highlight in a newspaper um, saying that the biggest China bank abandons 3 billion uh, Zimbabwe coal plan. Uh, of course, this uh, was a very delightful moment for uh, Zimbabwe uh, as, as China would not have that big impact on, um, on, on uh, their local communities. But of course, they still had the issue of not having sufficient energy. Um, but at least the coal power plant now doesn't have the financing that was promised by the Chinese because the Chinese bank uh, abandoned it personally. We're not necessarily sure whether our uh, civil society uh, movement was the one indicating it, but I think the movement building and the awareness around this uh, might have also uh, led to China rethinking this deal, um, uh, which of course we are very happy about. Uh, but in, if this uh, project was furthered and was actually implemented, uh, we wanted to also look at what kind of effects this would have had on the local communities. Um, in that sense, um, of course, what you see here is that the bigger in, in, uh, uh, international dimensions were, of course, that if China had lended them the money, uh, you would have gotten that financial debt, which many African nations are still uh, yeah, living by, basically, uh, even though it would uh, ensure more um, uh, power, more energy for uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the fact that it would be based on uh, some financial debt, this would uh, make Africa, or in this case Zimbabwe, very vulnerable uh, to um, yeah, the power dynamics and the increase of inequality, which of course we want to also address uh, within the principles of just transition. Uh, and what we see also with within China, the way they loan this nation's money is not uh, following the international standards that are there uh, and does definitely in this project definitely do not include the respect of uh, free prior informed consent. So what the, do the communities think about this and uh, the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights and how to uh, respect uh, people and the environment and make sure that there are no risks associated to this kind of investments. Um, so to go a little bit deeper, we also try to um, highlight what do, this would have meant for women in particular if this project uh, had been realized. Um, so that's why we want to zoom in a little bit on the gendered impacts. So if this would have come there uh, and it would have been done in a way that uh, could uh, include not only male but also uh, female uh, workers, there was a chance that uh, such a big investment of three, bi three billion would have created some sort of uh, local employment, uh, even though we of course see that it is main mainly men that would be uh, um, uh, employed in these sectors. And of course, it, with a, a 280 megawatt, it would definitely cover all that energy deficiency that Zimbabwe has been experiencing because it would basically uh, over double uh, the current energy supply that they have access to. So that would uh, be beneficial for women uh, and men in this case, uh, in, in terms of accessing energy and being able to um, uh, use that to the benefit. Unfortunately, um, there are also quite some negative impacts and I would like to ask you uh, what is not a negative impact or a possible ne negative impact of what would not have been a negative impact of the Sangwa on women? Would it have been land grabbing, health issues or formal job loss? So what is not a negative impact of the Sangwa project on women? Land grabbing, job loss, no, health issues, or job form, formal job loss. We were, we're waiting on a couple more answers. I'll give everyone another 10 seconds or so. Okay. Very good. 
Yeah, so uh, if the Sengwa project would have been there, uh, it would not have led to the formal job loss of women, uh, particularly because I explained that it's mainly men that get the jobs, women in general would not even get the job. And now what we see is also that women are not in the formal working sector. Um, the women that we work with, they mainly are burdened with unpaid care work. Um, so a formal job lost or gained in this case would not be uh, uh, identified as such. So the problem would mainly be how to address that the women would even be able to get jobs if any jobs were available uh, through the development of such a project. Thank you very much, Niels. Oh. Yeah, so land, uh, land grabbing is definitely um, an issue that would be would have been addressing uh, the the of would have been the case for the communities when you look at the Sengwa project. So it was already allocated, uh, and just because China fell away doesn't necessarily mean they will not be able to find another investor. But they were now indicating that around 138. Um, uh, pieces of land of about uh, 32 square kilometers each uh, would basically be uh, falling under the pipeline of water which would supply that coal power, power, powered fire, fire plant uh, and that would mean that everything along that line would have to e uh, evacuate and move out of the way for that to be uh, made possible. Um, and the thing with this land is that it is communal land which means that it is not necessarily somebody's land, which also makes it a little bit more uh, easy for governments to um, uh, grab this land from the local communities and uh, really use it for their own purposes because they they uh, qualified as communal land. So if uh, the government's uh, argument is that it's useful for the whole community, it can be as easy as such to just um, uh, reallocate uh, these people at different locations to live just because they want to use that land, which of course um, would lead uh, for women in particular to uh, lose their uh, uh, ways of providing in their livelihoods and uh, exacerbate, of course, the inequalities that um, we have been addressing. Because if they can, they don't have any food security, not don't have an uh, an, an income to provide in their livelihood, that will uh, bring them a little bit more in a spiral of um, more inequality uh, and poverty as such. Um, and reallocation also means that they have to definitely find new ways of living. Um, what we also see with uh, particularly uh, coal-fired -fire power plant is that a lot of people that live around these uh, coal plants will um, uh, uh, identify, will get or will have uh, problems associated with breathing um, or um, have complications with that. We also see that a lot of mercury uh, uh, is produced while um, mining coal. I think also if you look at the northern countries that have banned coal mining, it's also because a lot of people were also identified uh, as having quite some health issues due to coal-fired uh, power plants. And this is also why it was such a big issue and so important for Zimbabwe to really have an advocacy plan on uh, ensuring that it's not a coal-fired power plant uh, coming in because it has so many other risks for the local communities and the women particularly because when they get sick, uh, they will also still have to do their unpaid care work by taking care of their families uh, or just being taking care of their men that are part of uh, this uh, uh, formal workers within the coal-fired power plants, but also if their men would die or disappear from uh, working in such a coal-fired power plant, that would mean even more a burden on the women uh, near um, these uh, mining areas. And uh, last but not least, uh, of course, uh, coal is one of the fossil fuels, uh, which of course uh, produces toxins which are not uh, good for the environment, particularly um, the water get polluted. Um, uh, next to the fact that uh, what 
uh, was indicated is that this big pipeline would go from uh, the, the uh, Zambezi River and then uh, basically use most of the water that also local communities use uh, for um, their daily chores and then use that for in the power plants, which would of course cause a lack of um, uh, water supplies uh, and the water that would be there would only be um, polluted as such. So uh, in conclusion, my colleague had, had written it down that that would val violate, of course, the right to life, the right to health, uh, but also right to water and environment, uh, as is also recognized under the constitution of Zimbabwe. Uh, and yet again, women and girls would be then carrying the most burden of uh, trying to ensure uh, they can deal with this best by, for example, going further to fetch for water for uh, their local uh, families. In conclusion, um, I have touched upon this a little bit. So for Zimbabwe and now it is very important that um, when we advocate, we go towards uh, leveraging more of the clean energy sources. So whether it's that, that is hydropower or just thinking of ways in which uh, um, other renewable energy sources can be more leveraged instead of going to projects like uh, a coal fired power plant. Uh, what is also Im interesting and important to note is that in Zimbabwean law, there is already something that is called an environmental impact assessment, which dictates that um, basically all incoming projects should identify what uh, environmental and socioeconomic impacts could be of such a project and make sure that they include citizens in developing these assessments to make sure that they know what the impact is on the environment and the impact on the people. But what is seen is that these assessments most of the times are not done inclusively, are not done with the voices of the people on the ground, um, which of course also aligns with the fact that um, investors and developers should carry out internationally recognized due diligence processes. Um, but in these cases, most of the time that is not done and communities are not asked or involved in identifying the risks uh, of such businesses. And of course, um, there are many uh, international and domestic treaties that speak about uh, particularly land issues, but also human rights uh, in relation to uh, large scale investments. Uh, and we see most of the times that uh, even if this treaty, treaties are signed, it means very little for the uh, implementation, uh, particularly, uh, or the translation into actual uh, national actions. Um, so that there is more need to do that inclusively as well. So in conclusion, uh, from Zimbabwe, our colleagues would demand energy systems that are uh, greener, more resilient, uh, implemented in care without undermining social justice and environmental sustainability. I hope I did my colleague justice by trying to present for him. Um, yet again, please uh, include your questions in the chat and we can uh, get back to them uh, a little bit uh, later after our last presentation. Um, I would like to give the space to my colleague uh, Haizal from Guatemala. Um, I would like to give you also the floor to shortly introduce yourself and uh, very well tell us about the great work we have been doing in Guatemala. Um, and of course, I'll be there to press for the next slide. Go ahead, Haizal. Uh, hi, good evening all the person in this call. Uh, my name is Hazel Sanchez. I work at Action in Guatemala, uh, like manager, program manager uh, with co a Maya community in, in this country. And um, in last year, uh, Action in Netherlands and Action in, in Guatemala uh, make a research about palm oil and woman, uh, woman right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but uh, it's the first uh, work uh, together, but uh, 
we work uh, 10, 10 years, more 10 years uh, for this topic in, in this country and in advocacy and research and support the community uh, all to uh, 10 years, 10 years ago. Uh, my English is no good and uh, other colleagues support me uh, for this presentation. Um, uh, next, please, Sophie. Ana, voy a hablar en español. Las plantaciones, las plantaciones de palma se establecieron eh, eh, a finales de 1990, las primeras plantaciones, y básicamente han habido momentos en las cuales ha habido mayor expansión de este cultivo en el país. So, uh, I will be translating for uh, Heisel some parts of the presentation. Um, as also, also I mentioned on the slide, um, the first plantations of palm oil uh, were established in, uh, in Guatemala in the 1990s, but then in history, there are some specific moments that really um, had an influence on the expansion of palm oil uh, plantations. En los últimos 20 años, ha incrementado un 470% Eh, las plantaciones de palma y actualmente hay más de 180.000 hectáreas en el país. So at this moment there are more than 180,614 hectares of uh, palm oil plantations in the country uh, and it has risen um, more than 100% in over the, the last two decades. Este porcentaje de incremento eh, se dio en, ma eh, en mayor medida a partir de el boom o de los agrocombustibles como una energía eh, sostenible. Um, so this um, monoculture has expanded as one of the um, yeah, new promises or booms in uh, sustainable energy development. Y eh, esta área que estoy señalando acá es el área de mayor expansión en los últimos años. Y es área de población eh, eh, de comunidades indígenas maya quechí. Um, disculpa, Jaisel, ¿es el área del norte? Tierras Bajas del Norte. Ya. Yeah. So, um, the northern part uh, region on the map that you're seeing is the area where the main expansion in the, in the last years has taken place. And it's specifically this area that is inhabited by uh, indigenous Maya communities. Eh, al igual que los casos anteriores, este tipo de, que, que se han presentado hoy de, eh, de Uganda y Zimbabue, estos tipos de cultivos generan eh, acaparamiento de tierra y eh, que la gente vaya, que, que la gente migre. Yeah, so um, very similar to the cases that were presented on Uganda and in Zimbabue. Um, specifically, uh, the expansion of, uh, of palm oil plantations uh, leads to land grabbing in the country and also to a lot of migration uh, of, of local communities. Y bueno, los impactos los vamos a abordar un poco más después, pero lo que quisiera resaltar en este momento es el apoyo que da el gobierno a este tipo de, de empresas. So we will talk about uh, the imp impacts of uh, palm oil plantations a bit later. Um, but what Chazel uh, would like to highlight now is uh, specifically um, yeah, the, the help or support uh, these plantations are getting from the government of Guatemala. Y eh, aquí coloco la cita que dice que la industria de palma ha cambiado a las comunidades y ha generado desarrollo según la opinión del actual presidente. So, according to the government, um, these plantations, palm oil plantations, actually uh, led to a lot of development of the communities, um, especially according to the, the current president. Y quiero de, dar dos datos. Número uno, que las plantaciones de palma generan una fuente de trabajo por cada seis hectáreas. Y número dos, el nivel de pobreza en Guatemala es del 70.5%.
Um, so actually, uh, there are two uh, quite sort of illustrative dates or, uh, or facts. Um, basically, plantations of palm oil um, actually provide one job per six hectares of uh, yeah, palm oil plantation. And um, there's extreme poverty among 70.5% uh, of the population. Como parte también de los apoyos de, que da el gobierno, se han generado leyes a favor de las empresas. Y una de ellas es una ley que tenía que ver, o, o un mandato que tenía que ver con que la palma aceitera era considerada de alto, de alto riesgo. Y sin embargo, eh, sin argumento alguno, se considera ahora de bajo riesgo. Por lo cual los estudios de impacto ambiental pasan de manera más rápida en el ministerio. So basically the government um, has developed several different laws that are actually in support of palm oil or the expansion of palm oil plantations, such as um, a law that um, establishes that palm oil is a low risk commodity, um, while it was before um, considered a high risk priority, which now means that the, the impact assessments uh, on the environment pass more easily uh, in ministries. Uh, when considering a new uh, palm oil plantation. Y como parte del contexto, quisiera mencionar que pues más, hace más de 10 años se han venido documentando los impactos en las violaciones de derechos humanos eh, de las mujeres y de las comunidades indígenas eh, sobre eh, acaparamiento de tierra, sobre violaciones a, a los derechos de libre determinación de los pueblos, eh, al acceso al agua, a trabajo digno y otra serie de impactos. Mm -hmm. So, um, Action Aid Guatemala has been working in the last uh, 10 years to gather evidence on uh, violations of human rights and specifically uh, on women, women's rights, um, mainly when it comes to uh, land grabbing, uh, when it comes to free prior and informed consent, and also when it comes to the, the impact on, uh, on water supply for the communities. Eh, next eh, slide. Ah, nos gustaría hacerles una pregunta. Eh, y bueno, se las leerá Ana. Um, sure. So, uh, what percentage of palm oil produced in Guatemala in uh, 2020 was exported um, or was for export purposes? And uh, you can, of course, uh, all vote again. Just waiting on one or two more responses. I'll give everyone five or 10 more seconds. Um, so the answer, uh, every, or most people uh, gave, was 80%, did I say? Sí, efectivamente, el 80% de lo que se produce en el país está, eh, se exporta eh, to, a, a nivel mundial. Y algunos países eh, a donde va este aceite es España, eh, Países Bajos, Italia y Alemania. Um, so that is indeed correct. It's 80% that's being exported around the world. And uh, a big part of um, the exports go to Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, and Germany. Y tal vez aquí quiero llamar la atención en el hecho de que Guatemala, un país tan pequeño, incluso Centroamérica representa menos del 1% de la tierra en el mundo. Es el sexto productor mundial de palma y el tercer mayor exportador de palma y aceite en el mundo. So even uh, a country as small as Guatemala, which actually only um, is, is one percent of land that exists worldwide, is the sixth um, producer of palm oil around the world and is the third country uh, biggest in exports of palm oil. Y aquí vemos dos vínculos en lo internacional, uno que tiene que ver con el mercado, y cómo toda lo, 
la mayor parte que se produce en Guatemala va a otros países, pero también hay un vínculo que se va a hablar más adelante sobre la incidencia que se hace para que las empresas mejoren las prácticas, que es eh, las bocas. Um, so here we see uh, two links, global links actually of, uh, of this case. Uh, one is the global market for palm oil, and the other one is uh, international advocacy efforts uh, actually is working on. Y quizá mencionar de la parte de abajo de la gráfica que, bueno, eh, efectivamente de ese 80%, buena parte se dirige eh, especialmente a Europa, eh, a España y a los Países Bajos. Um, so, what you can see in the graph below is that. Uh, Yeah, a big part of the 80% that's uh, being exported is, is going towards Europe and specifically uh, Spain and, uh, and the Netherlands. Y como se ve, esta gráfica pertenece desde, tiene registros desde el 2015 a la actualidad y los mayores países siguen estos que, que se ha mencionado y pues también incluye México, pero sí hay una importante eh, producción que se va para, para Europa. Y hay una reducción en el tiempo de lo que se exportaba a México, que ahora va para Europa. Um, so as you can see in the graph as well, a, a quite a big part goes to Mexico as well. Um, but as you can see, it has been uh, diminishing in the last years and the exports to Europe are going up. Siguiente, next, please. Como parte del, del estudio que realizamos, nos enfocamos en los impactos de las mujeres era eh, los impactos que menos habíamos abordado en el pasado, pero que requieren eh, concentrarnos en ellos. So for this specific research that has been done last year, uh, there was a, a specific focus on the impacts on women because they are uh, impacted disproportionately. And in the past, um, there hadn't been a specific research uh, on that aspect, uh, but that needs more attention. Y... Hemos colocado acá tres, eh, agrupado en tres los impactos y lo, lo importante es decir es que los impactos que, que está teniendo eh, limitan la autonomía de las mujeres. So, um, three main impacts uh, which have more specific uh, well, impacts in it. So, it's a, it's a grouped impact um, have been identified. And all of these impacts um, basically limit the autonomy of women in, uh, in the communities. Lo primero es porque tiene menos menos medios de vida al que puede acceder. Por ejemplo, tiene menos no tiene posibilidad de tener tierra. Hablábamos del acaparamiento de tierra. No tiene posibilidad por ende de de producir sus alimentos. Eh, tampoco eh, la palma genera tanto trabajo como decía anteriormente, pero en particular a las mujeres, eh, en, las empresas no, no las contratan, menos del 0.5% de las personas que trabajan en la palma son mujeres eh, y pues se limita eh, la posibilidad de tener una mejor calidad de vida en torno a el impacto en los eh, de vida. Um, so the main, one of the main impacts is on the livelihoods of women. Um, there are several impacts there. Um, women uh, don't have access to land due to palm oil production. Um, that also means that they cannot produce their own um, own foods and uh, agricultural products. And uh, the plantations don't offer uh, much jobs, as uh, Giselle already explained, but especially women are not being contracted by plantations. Um, and this greatly impacts the quality of life of women in, uh, in local communities. Eh, el trabajo de las mujeres, el trabajo no remunerado, no pagado, el trabajo del cuidado, eh, se ha incrementado en las mujeres porque eh, tienen que cuidar a eh, familiares enfermos, se quedan a cargo de las responsabilidades de sus padres o suegros cuando los maridos van a trabajar. Eh, se tienen que levantar más temprano en el caso de que eh, los hijos o esposos vayan a trabajar para hacerles alimento. Y también invierten muchísimo más tiempo en toda esta parte de eh, conseguir medios de vida. Leña, agua, 
eh, frutos del bosque. Um, so also the unpaid care work of women increases due to the palm oil plantations. Um, work at the plantations, but also in their uh, and surroundings cause uh, more sickness and health issues. So that means also women have to take care of their uh, sick family members. Um, they care for the rest of the family. And it also means that those who are working on the uh, plantations and have to go further for their work um, need to bring their foods and, and women pre prepare those foods. And uh, as well as, um, th yeah, they have to, um, go further to fetch water, to fetch wood, um, and to, to find uh, nuts and other, um, well, foods in the region. Eh, antes se hablaba de la doble o triple jornada de trabajo de las mujeres. Ahora no se habla ni de doble ni de triple trabajo, sino de jornadas redondas, en el cual no encuentran las mujeres un espacio de descanso ni físico ni emocional, porque uno de los, otro de los impactos que se logra identificar es que hay una carga emocional de parte de la mujer, de ser el pilar y de quien sostiene eh, a la familia en, en lo emocional, en lo económico y en asegurar las condiciones de vida. So in the past, in Guatemala, they would talk about um, double or triple workloads of, of women. But basically, the impacts of the plantation um, haven't doubled or tripled the work, but they would say that it's full-time job for women, uh, 24 hours, and that it has a, a big, um, poses a big strain, uh, both physically and emotionally. Also emotionally, because they feel they are the pillar of the family and they have to, to be the... Um, the persons that are strongest and always take care of everyone, which poses a, a big emotional uh, strain on, on women. Y eh, otro, el, el último de los ejes que se ha identificado es eh, la violencia eh, institucional y sexual. Y eh, esto se refiere básicamente al aumento de la criminalización eh, a las mujeres. Eh, y también a los hombres, pero también eh, cómo implica esto a las mujeres y la violencia sexual que ha sido, a, que ahora es más frecuente en las comunidades que están cercanas a las plantaciones. Um, so also one of the impacts is institutional and sexual violence. Um, one of the impacts is criminalization um, of those, um, yeah, defending uh, their rights uh, in the communities. Um, and that's both criminalization of women, but also of their husbands and the indirect impact that, that supposes for women and their families. And the other one is an increase in sexual violence for those families living closest to the, uh, the plantations. Next, please. ¿Qué hacemos como Action Aid Guatemala? Eh, tenemos trabajo a todos los niveles, eh, local, nacional e internacional. Y en este momento los trabajos lo, eh, a nivel comunitario e internacional son los de, los de mayor énfasis. So, as ActionAid Guatemala, um, the project focuses both on uh, local, uh, regional, national and international level. And the main focus at this moment is uh, the community level, but also the international level. Eh, la razón de por qué centrarnos en lo comunitario y en lo internacional es por el contexto nacional en el que estamos. Eh, es un gobierno que, que ha actuado en contra de las comunidades, las organizaciones, eh, y hay un alto nivel de corrupción. Eh, y ya se mencionaba anteriormente el apoyo que tiene actualmente el sector palmero en empresarial en su conjunto por parte de las autoridades nacionales. So the main reason to focus on the community level and the international level is basically the, the internet, so the national context in Guatemala at the moment. Um, the government is heavily opposing to uh, the work of communities, but also uh, of civil society organizations. And uh, there is a very high rate of corruption uh, with it at the national level, which uh, limits the possibilities to work at the national level. 
and also uh, the current government um, largely supports um, the plantations and the plantation owners um, and not so much civil society. Y solo mencionar que al nivel comunitario el trabajo se hace para organizar a las comunidades y se ha logrado eh, establecer un movimiento de comunidades en defensa del agua y se está formando una coordinadora territorial de mujeres. So at the community level, uh, they basically focus on training uh, local communities uh, on their rights and they've been able to establish a, a broad movement of communities um, uh, which are co called the communities in defense of water. And they are also establishing uh, yeah, territorial or local coordination uh, of, of a network of women at the commu community level. Nivel municipal, mantenemos comunicación con las autoridades y eh, impulsamos acuerdos políticos para eh, que las empresas mejoren sus derechos, mejoren sus, sus prácticas en el respeto de derechos. So at the municipal level, at the moment, they have uh, quite a lot of contact with, uh, with local uh, governments, such as mayors, and they're um, pushing for uh, agreements pushed for by, uh, by the municipalities between the, uh, the companies, palm oil companies and communities to ensure uh, the community's rights. Y con el mismo objetivo, también trabajamos a nivel nacional en alianza con con la Procuraduría de Derechos eh, Humanos y algunos políticos aliados o de bancadas aliadas eh, que pueden poner a discusión estos temas y, y pelear eh, mejores condiciones para las comunidades, el cumplimiento de derechos. So at the national level, um, they follow the same strategy, basically. Um, at the institutional level, they have... Um, contact with the human rights attorney, which in, in a lot of countries is called the human rights ombudsman. Um, and uh, focuses on um, also improving livelihoods and, uh, and the conditions of uh, local communities. And they have a contact with a few parliamentarians and politicians that do push for uh, the rights of these communities. Can we maybe round up because we want to leave some space for questions, Gijzel? Is that possible? Okay. Yeah. Entendiste? Que una pregunta? que um, si podemos ir cerrando uh, sí, sí, sí. para tener un poco de tiempo. Sí, ya, ya hemos cerrado eh, a nivel internacional. Esos son los espacios y solo ir a las recomendaciones. En el siguiente, next. So, in, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, Sofía, and we will go to the recommendations. Eh, nos quisimos, pensando en el, en el grupo que, estamos eh, que está presente en el espacio, Solo quisimos hacer cuatro recomendaciones que, que pudieran eh, ubicarse, digamos, en lo que puede hacer cada una de las personas que participamos acá. Y tal vez leer las recomendaciones, uh, Anne. Sí. Yeah. Um, so, when uh, Hazel was preparing this presentation, uh, she was also thinking, what can I recommend to the people present uh, during this presentation? Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I will read them out to save a little bit of, uh, of time of translating. Um, a due diligence law is uh, at the moment being developed at European level, but there's also push for a due diligence law uh, in the Netherlands, um, which can be very important to stop human rights uh, violations and impacts on the environment, uh, which we can promote uh, for approval and implementation. Um, then it's also important to identify what you can consume. Also, it's, um, it's important to, to stress that it's, of course, not the consumer's responsibility, but uh, um, government responsibility, but still it's, uh, it's important to be aware of uh, yeah, actually all the products that contain uh, palm oil and that might be linked to, uh, to, these, to these violations. Um, then join information and awareness campaigns so that due diligence legislation um, can, be, uh, can be reached and report violations of the rights of indigenous peoples, women, men and children. Um, and ask oneself uh, about the specific impacts on women um, because they might be bearing or they are bearing the highest cost of, uh, um, of palm oil um, production. Um, and it's, it's good to be aware of that. 
Thank you very much, Raisel, uh, and thank you very much, Anna, uh, our colleague, for the translation. I think we don't have that many minutes left, Mers, to ask the questions, but I would still like to open the floor. We have about six minutes, and I also invite uh, my colleagues and myself to give short answers so we can take as many questions as possible. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see the questions better. Um, so bear with us. I have, an, I have an overview of the questions and I'm going to give a preference to the questions of people that I know aren't in the, in the summer school to start with at least, um, just so that we, we, we get those answered. Um, the ones in the chat, I think the first one that, that maybe is of interest just to clarify some things are the recommendations that we saw, especially those from the Sengwa project. Who, who are those for? Are those for national governments? Are those for local governments? Or is it for, for, for Dutch governments? Who, who, are, who are the recommendations for? So? Yeah, so mainly in our work as Action Aid, um, so whether it's in the Netherlands or in uh, Guatemala, Zimbabwe or Uganda, we direct our um, recommendations to national governments, uh, international governments, because they are the ones that have most power in really changing the system in which we uh, base all our activities on. So for example, what I said about the uh, environmental assessment, Im impact assessment that is there, it's really a national government policy, which is not well implemented. So it's also up to the government to really ensure that uh, the implementation of uh, that kind of uh, projects uh, or policies are well done and include communities vo voices. Excellent. Um, I, there's a Spanish question in there. It's been a. It, I haven't done Spanish since high school, but I can. I see that uh, um, that Chazel has already answered that. Um, maybe if I can ask, maybe Anna, if you could uh, enlighten us, uh, us non-Spanish speakers, as to what the question was and what the uh, answer was. Uh, yeah, give me a second to check. Um, 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 what do you think is most important uh, to ensure a feminist just transition? Would it be distributing the, uh, the unpaid care work? Um, and then Hazel's answer is, uh, thanks a lot for your question. Um, sorry, one second. Um, I think that um, to have a just feminist just transition, it would be uh, necessary to um, to um, highlight uh, women's rights uh, when it comes to access to uh, natural resources, redistributing work, uh, but also. Um, Sorry, <laughs> I can't think of the word. Um, showing that um, the companies um, should also give work to. Ah, sorry, I see Rose her uh, response. I cannot think of the translation of reconocimiento. Um, uh, recognition. I don't know. Yeah, recognition. Quizá, <laughs> quizá, bueno, lo que estoy queriendo decir es que eh, las, eh, para que los hombres puedan estar trabajando en la plantación, las, las mujeres se hacen cargo del de cuidado de la casa, digamos, de, del cuidado de ellos y todo. Y ellas mismas, las mismas mujeres han planteado que ese, ese trabajo que realizan no es pagado por la empresa y no es reconocido por la empresa. Entonces ellas hablan de, de ese reconocimiento y ese pago que deberían de recibir. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, basically the men work at the plantations and the women uh, don't get paid for the work, although they, they do have a, a, a huge workload to take care of the families. And there should be recognition for this on, on the part of the, the companies. Um, and they are claiming that uh, also women should be paid for, for this work they are doing and contributing to, to the communities. Y lo que hablaba inicialmente también tenía que ver con 
eh, que la tierra, las mujeres nunca han querido vender la tierra, pero como no tienen un documento legal que así lo, que así, que así lo, lo indique, eh, pues las empresas han, se han quedado con las propiedades. Uh -huh. um, so what um, Rose is also uh, saying in the chat, that um, a big key term in unpaid care work is uh, to recognize, distribute and, and reward. So this reward should also go to women. All right, shall we maybe take one question la as last for Esther? I saw yeah. something about, uh, maybe I don't know if you had anything else, but um, so uh, I saw something on uh, whether tourism also has an effect on uh, land grabbing. Do we experience anything of that? And maybe also to add, um, I think somebody was asking about what is the, lo the, the role of the local uh, national governments in both cases. Uh, would that have been answered already or can Esther say something about that a little bit? Uh, the, the tourism one, I believe Esther has answered in the, in the chat. Um, but what was the role of local and national governments is still, uh, is still open. Um, so I would be, uh, I'd be interested to hear as to what Esther's uh, perspective is on that. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, The role of the local government, of course, uh, is to ensure that, um, number one, we, we, we work with the existing laws and we make them work for the people and for the communities. And uh, also ensure that whatever laws, international laws that we've ratified have been domesticated. An example would be like the UN binding treaties that uh, uphold the principles of uh, protecting the women, uh, protecting the, 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 the protection, um, protecting the community by the government and ensuring that uh, all the investors adhere to the both national laws and then the domesticated international laws. That's what that national uh, government should be doing. But the challenge is they're not doing that because of other, because of corruption tendencies And because of, uh, should I say, uh, they, are, they are greedy. Let me say greedy for money at the expense of the communities and at the expense of the, of the, of the, of the, of the people who are suffering. So that's the same challenge that we're having. And it has to take us, the communities and the, and the CSOs, like ActionAid, to ensure that these people hold the governments accountable. And it's through letting them know what their rights are and what they should hold the government against in terms of accountability. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. And with that, I think I will um, conclude this session. I would like to thank everybody before I give Niels the floor back uh, to really round it up. Um, thank you, maybe in summarizing, I hope you get a little bit more of an understanding why Uh, we are so invested in this term, uh, a just transition, mainly also looking at that bigger picture of what it does to communities and particularly women when we invest in certain projects that might be framed as sustainable and addressing the energy transition or in other cases where um, uh, it's as if the, the, the climate impacts are really neglected uh, and uh, some solutions are being made which are not taken into account the local contexts and needs and possible impacts. Um, so we will continue to do this work because unfortunately uh, the time is not there yet to conclude this, um, but you can always keep in touch with us. Um, uh, we have different reports on all the projects we have done. So we have a report on uh, the principles of a just transition you can find on our website and the a very nicely written report on palm oil and, and women's rights is also on our website. So please find us for any questions, but also um, uh, visit our website for the reports. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, and then a very, very final note for those of you who are part of the summer school uh, on a more permanent basis. Uh, we have another Teams link again so that you can have a quick chat with our uh, presenters. Um, And uh, to anyone else uh, not from the summer school, uh, please also consider signing up for the uh, 
final webinar of our uh, Just Transition Summer School, or our Climate Justice Summer School series, uh, which is going to be on climate finance, uh, both at the international and at the national level. Um, so I hope to see you all there. Um, I think we're going to wrap up here and we're going to transition over to Teams for, uh, for those people. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for joining. Thank you. To